we'll have uh, Brother Jack come, and then I'll have you sing your song right before I preach. How's that? All right. Brother Jack, if you want to come share with us. You know how we do it here, buddy. You just take your time and follow the Lord. Well, I think it's been three years since I've been here, but for some reason it's harder to get up here to watch the you're preaching to the choir, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I told someone earlier the wind was blowing so hard this morning it blew all my hair off. Amen. I've been blessed already this morning. I come to share this morning the, the ministry of the, of the Gideons, but I've been spoke to the songs we sang, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. I saw the light. I was 28 years old when that light came to me. And come from a, a good family, not a Christian family. God was good to me. I was married happily, four children, good job. But I had a big void in my life. I saw the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but. And when I talked to Pastor Thad, he says, however the Spirit leads, the Spirit's leading to cut this short because I want to hear what the Lord has laid on pastors part this morning. So I'll get right into why I'm here this morning. It's, we want to talk about changing lives. And that's what the Gideon ministry is all about. Placing uh, the Word of God in the traffic lanes of life. And someone picking up uh, uh, a New Testament or a Bible that's laying in the doctor's office, uh, the motel room, uh, jail or, or wherever, and God's Word is, is changing the lives. And one of the scriptures that uh, the Gideons uh, hold fast to is Isaiah 55, 11, and it says this, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And that is to see men and women, boys and girls, come to a steady knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a couple of businessmen, almost 120 years ago, was, was meeting, uh, uh, was lodging in, in a hotel room. And the Gideon uh, Foundation was, was formed then. And since then, uh, billions of copies of, of the Word of God have uh, been distributed. And it's not the Gideons that's changing the lives. It's the work of the Holy Spirit through God's Holy Word. And God is pleased and glorified when lives are changed. And praise God for that. Uh, for these changed lives, uh, um, not only through the Gideon ministry, but through the ministry of local churches uh, such as yours. Uh, you know, I know your church, like mine, supports missionaries around the world. We can't get into 200 countries, but the Gideons are with God's Word. And I'll share some testimonies in a little bit about how uh, God's Word is not returning the void, but it's accomplished that which is perfect, but His purpose. Uh, this church and many others are a big part of, of this Gideon ministry. We partner together to get the gospel out. And together we can accomplish the truth that I read in Isaiah uh, 55 camps. Uh, last year alone, uh, there was over uh, 10 million copies of God's Word distributed uh, in the United uh, States. Uh, outside the United States, over 72 million. And that's a, does every one of these Bibles uh, get in the right hands? Uh, no, the bottom of it finds their way into a dumpster. I'm going to share a testimony of a, a lady who found a dumpster bag. And I'll tell you about that. <clears throat> but these Bibles are placed in, in the traffic lanes of life. I'm going to mention a little bit ago about this. And where, where were we? Put these Bibles, public women, in, in schools and universities, jails, hospitals, nursing homes, doctor's offices, uh, military, uh, police departments, fire stations. And some of you that might be as old as I am, 
or close to it. How many of you received one of these Bibles in fifth grade? You know, we can't do that today. In Polk County, we, we don't cheat and take that situation, but out here at the Trail of Courage, uh, there's busloads of kids uh, come into the Trail of Courage in the fall, and we can't go on the buses and pass these out, but as these children are getting on the buses, we can pass these out. And so uh, there are several hundred fifth graders still getting uh, uh, the Word of God. And uh, I just want to take a, a, a little time here uh, to, it's, it's my favorite part of, of giving a presentation is give you testimonies of how people uh, came to, to know the Lord because of opening up God's Word was placed there. And this first one is this lady thoughts of, uh, thoughts of suicide left her an Ethiopian woman could not stand life's pressures especially the challenges of her teenage son voices inside kept telling her to end her life and all her problems she finally decided to obey the voices and she began to search her house for a rope with which to hang herself she began searching her son's bedroom to find a rope, but instead found a blue Gideon testament on the floor under the bed. Her son had received the testament during a school distribution the day before. She picked up the testament and began to read. It says, Come to me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. She began to feel at ease, and the thoughts of suicide left her as she continued to read. Uh, the woman decided she needed to go to church so she could ask God to deliver her. This was her first time in a Protestant church, and as she was waiting for the service to start, uh, she kept on reading the Testament. That day, the pastor preached from Matthew 11, 28, the same verse uh, that she had read in the Gideon Testament. That day, she made a decision to receive Christ as her personal Savior. The following week, her son also made a decision to receive Christ, or receive Christ. God had truly delivered her. And for the price of a uh, little over a, a cup of coffee or a, a stop at McDonald's, we can still get these New Testaments in the hands of people that, that really uh, need them. Uh, another testimony. No one ever told him. Last year, my wife and I signed up to go to nursing homes and hospitals to help carry out distributions. One day, we went to a large 17-story nursing home in New York City. We were told that they were shorthanded and we would have to carry our scriptures up to the top floor ourselves and work our way down. We placed a hospital testament beside each bed and the auxiliary ladies gave each of the nurses their own medical testament. Before I left that particular floor, I took three full Bibles to the dining room where the residents were playing games and I placed them there. As I started out the door, I saw a very old man sitting in a wheelchair by the door. I patted the back of his head and struck up a conversation with him. I found out his name was Hugh, and after a few minutes, he asked me where I was from. I said, what makes you think I am from New York City? What makes you think I am not from New York City? Hugh laughed and said, you are not from New York City with an accent like that. I told him I'd come all the way from Arkansas just to tell him about Jesus Christ. At that, his eyes filled with tears, and he said, No one has ever done that before. As we talked more, I asked him if he were to die today, where he would go. He said, I would like to think that I would go to heaven, but I don't think I would, he continued. There again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't think he would, he continued. I don't know how, and no one has ever told me how. I knelt down in front of him with my personal work as testament and shared the plan of salvation with him. When I came to the last verse, Romans 10, 9, I asked if he would like, if he would read it aloud. He said, he read, that if thou shalt confess, I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When he finished reading uh, the verse, he said, that is what I want to do. Right now, I want to be saved. 
who bowed our heads together as you prayed and asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. Come into his heart and save his soul. I put his name in the back of the testament and, and filled in the date. I asked him how old he was. Now get this. And he said he had turned 100 the previous uh, year. Uh, he would be 101. In another month, we would went back to visit him the following year, but found out he had gone to be with the Lord. What a blessing to be the first one to ever share Jesus with, with, with you. And to think of it. It's great that a man 100 years old would get saved. Sure. But look at the amount of blessings that he missed out on because he wasn't saved as a child or as a young person. Uh, like I mentioned a little bit ago, I was saved at the age of 28. I missed out on a lot of blessings as a teenager. Thank God that uh, he found a 28-year-old young man that, that needed the Lord. And when God saved me, and I started to be a disciple, found the truth of God's Word, that, you know, heaven's a a marvelous place, a wonderful place. Right. And at the age of 28, I'd have been a lot better off in heaven than I was on this earth. But you know what? I was convicted that God saved me to serve. And if someone would have told me that I'd be up here standing in front of a congregation like this, I said, no way, this little bicycle farm boy, I, I was called to work. And, I, and I'm not a preacher, but I do, I do serve. Uh, and uh, God for, for that opportunity. Uh, and that is, and while I'm here today, it's not about me, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He can do in people's lives if they just uh, surrender and obey. Uh, this one, testimony is entitled, Literally Seconds Away. Terry Hensley was a single mom in Billings, Montana, working a full-time job. Life was tough. She knew her life was meaningless, and spiraling downhill. When she looked into the mirror, all she saw was a failure. She knew she had reached the bottom when she found herself sitting in a dark closet with a pistol ready to end her life. In desperation, she cried out to God, if for some reason I should not end my life right here, right now, you need to do something. Just then, her son burst through the front door. God works in mysterious ways, folks. But, yeah, listen. but right then, her son burst through the front door of their home shouting, Mama, Mama, come look what I have. Terry put the pistol away, composed herself as much as possible, and walked out to meet her son, who was waving uh, a, a New Testament he had received from a Gideon at school that day. Terry says that Gideon was listening and doing God's will, and he had no idea that life was literally seconds away from eternity. That day, and... That day, she and her son opened God's word together, and she began her faith journey. And I got a folder here of his testimonies after testimonies that I could probably be here all the middle of the afternoon. But I want to hear Pastor uh, that what God is laid on his heart this morning. And I just want to, uh, when you think of the ministry of this church and the ministry of the Gideons, I think of the Great Commission is found in, in the book of Matthew, the last chapter. Uh, verse 19, and this is a command that we're, we're to do. Go ye, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So we have our work cut out. You know, we live next door to people that's unsaved. We work with people that's unsaved. Don't get kind. Yeah, there. And uh, what a what a joy it is to to serve the Lord. And as a Gideon, I want to thank you for your faithful support now through the years. You're not a large congregation, but you're one of the uh, congregations that gives us the largest love offering that we can continue to uh, send men as an assignment throughout the world of, of getting out God's word. That Boys and girls, and then women can come to a set of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Matt. Brother Jack has been such a
blessing to me down through the years, and I'm always glad to have him come and speak to us about the Gideon ministry. Before we hear Donita's song, I want to share a testimony of my own that uh, about I'm not sure that it was a Gideon Bible, but I believe that it probably was. Every year in the summertime, I make my way down home. Uh, and I wind up preaching. It's, it's kind of a neat thing. Maybe I'll invite the church to come down along with me someday. But there's a public access place on the Wabash River. And people come and go and they put their boats in and out. And they swim there. And it's just a nice place. And I hold, it's not really a revival, but it's a one night preaching. And there's a little shelter there uh, at the boat dock. And I set up in that shelter. I'll get a hold of some of my friends that live down there. And we'll have a little bit of gospel singing and a preaching message. And over the last several years, after the message, we wind up with one or two, sometimes ten or twelve. But we wind up with people who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Amen. And we enter into the Wabash River. We have a baptizing. And it's just a wonderful thing. There's a friend of mine I grew up with. We were little boys together. We played baseball together. We were in scouts together. We went to school together. We fought over the same girls together. Uh, <laughs> you know, just a really, really, his, his name is Chip. Chip Howard is his name. And when I got saved and began preaching, we remained friends, but he's kind of laughed and joked. And, uh, it's just a phase you're going through. You're going to get through it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and every year I ask Chip, will you come down to the river with us this year? No, no, no. I'll meet you tomorrow before you go home, and I ain't going down there for that type of a thing, you know. He's a construction worker. And I heard that he called me uh, several months ago, four months ago, maybe four or five months ago. He said, hey, I need to tell you something. I said, go ahead. He said, I was remodeling this house. An elderly lady passed away in her home. The children having me fix up the house so that they can sell it. And there's a bunch of boxes and things up in the attic. So I'm, I rented a dumpster. I'm going through all this stuff, throwing it in the dumpster. He said, I found one of the little Bibles. You know, the little bitty ones? I said, yeah. He said, well, I I opened that up and to the back and there's a plan there that leads you to Jesus Christ. That's what leads me to believe it's a Gideon Bible. And he said, I prayed that prayer. And I feel different about myself. So this year, this year when you come down to the river, I'd like to come. And I said, Chip, I would love to do that. So this year I'm going to get to baptize my friend Chip, who's received Jesus Christ because he found an old Bible in a box in the attic of the house that he was working on. Folks, the Word of God is powerful, and it can touch every heart. So I'm thankful for the Gideon ministry. And you and I didn't discuss this, and I apologize, because we normally work out a plan, but at the end of the service, and we don't take up offerings here uh, for our missionaries, but I'm, I'm not one of the guys that puts an offering plate under your nose, you know that. But at the end of the service today, Brother Jack and I will be standing down here with what they call a Bible plan. And if, you, if the Lord moves upon your heart to give a, a donation to the Gideons so that maybe your friend can get saved like my friend did, or like these countless others that Brother Jack mentioned. Um, I'll let you put your, your gift in his Bible. And then that way we can be supporting the good ministry. So with that being said, sis, go ahead and sing your song. This song, um, the Lord birthed to me in the night using an old, the old hymn. Lots of new one. And then last night I was at the end of the illness, I guess. But I picked it up anyway and brought it. And then when we sang about the blood of Jesus, I thought, wow. <laughs> God is one-minded. Yes. And he works through the Holy Spirit. So I pray this will touch your heart.
on Facebook and had so many people, three of them, come to the knowledge of the truth, receive Jesus Christ to be their Lord and their Savior. And when we go to the river here in Rochester this year, they're coming with us there so that they too can be baptized. Amen. The Lord didn't stop there. He moved and moved and moved upon my heart. Sister Carol called me. She said, hey, are, have you got a, have you got a, a, a home touch message ready? So I, the Holy Spirit moved upon me and I, I said, okay, I'm going to put this into the home touch ministry and it went out into the home touch. And I can tell you, Carol, I don't know if you get any feedback. Rose used to get feedback. I don't know if you get any feedback or not, but I received four letters from prison. Some of them are not even on our mailing list that just happened to get their hands on a copy of the home touch that made it to the prison. I've received letters. I'd like to hear more about this Jesus Christ. I'd like to hear more about the plan of salvation. Tell me more about the judgment to come. I'm guessing we're going to have more letters like that last week. So then the Lord moved upon me and I preached it on the radio. And I got I got I got word back from Tom Bear. He said, we've had some tremendous community response Amen. from this message that you preached on the radio. And he said, some of it's pretty good. <laughs> I said, not all of it. He said, well. This message keeps coming back to me over and over and over and over again. And as I said, I woke up this morning and this message came to me again. And so I feel like I need to preach this message here in your presence too. And listen, maybe you've already heard the message. And maybe the meat that is behind the message is something that the church is already familiar with. But I feel the need to preach it this morning. And hopefully it would stir something up on the inside of you. Even though you may already know it. Even though you may have already heard it. That it might stir something up on the inside of you. That it might stir the church from the inside. So that the church again might be burdened on behalf of the lost souls that are in our world. Maybe so that it might stir something up from within the church that we might be burdened uh, for the for the communities and for the and, and for the cities that we live in. We're living in a time where sin is running so very rapidly. I'm going to say this. Right now, I'm just following the Holy Spirit. I'm not in my notes yet, so none of this is part of that message, although it's leading me into it. I'm going to say something here today. I understand in the society that we're living in today might sound a little bit brazen. But we're living in a time where a person can go to jail because a dog has been in the backyard for too long and it cannot defend itself, it cannot speak for itself, it cannot say, hey, I'm cold, it cannot say, hey, I'm hungry, it can't say, hey, I'm thirsty. We're living in a society today where you can go to jail because a dog has been left in the backyard too long, but yet we can murder babies by the millions because someone doesn't want to be a parent. Right. There's something wrong with that. I didn't come here to be political, but I need our eyes to be open to the fact that there is sin running rampant, running rampant in our world today. And that it's become so commonplace that at one point in time, it used to stir a fire in the church but the church has been lulled to sleep by the voice of the enemy. Right. And we no longer see the injustice that sin is causing in our communities, in our homes, sad to say, even in our churches. Yeah. It's my hope and it's my prayer today that something will be stirred up on the inside so that the church, once again, can be burdened with with the need to have the gospel of Jesus Christ come again alive and well. I believe that it's time. We need 
to have conviction in our pulpits again and fire from our altars. This is where I began the message when I stood before all of these preachers. Those were my opening words. I believe as I stand before this group of ministers that we need to preach with more conviction from our pulpits and claim more fire upon our altars. Yes. That's my message before the church today. We've stopped preaching with conviction. We've stopped preaching with power. We've decided that we want to become authors of the next big self-help book and have people love us and people praise us and, and, and we want the praises of men more than we want to glorify God. And because of it, people's lives are being destroyed Amen. by sin. Today, I pray for preachers everywhere. From here to Timbuktu, that the Holy Ghost of God will move upon them and give them the power and the authority that is meant to be in the calling that they walk in. Right. And just to open up a Bible and declare the true word of God. The true word of God. I want to read some scripture to you. This is found in the book of Revelation, chapter number 14. Say amen when you're there. Revelation chapter 14. If you notice, the Lord has been leading me into the book of Revelation more and more. Which is also something that's new for me. As we open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14, when I start reading, we're going to start reading at verse number 14. I've noticed something, church. Over the last probably certainly 10 years, but maybe even closer to 15 or 20 I've noticed that only messages you ever hear being preached anymore are the ones that are extremely humanistic. Have you noticed that? I pray that if you haven't noticed that, that you'll start paying close attention because we've got these big name guys that everybody is falling over, head over heels in love with. Oh, I just love this one. I just love that one. I'm going to try hard not to throw names out because I don't believe that the Lord would really like that. But I just love this guy, and I just, I just love his ministry, and I, and I never miss him. And if I'm going to miss him, I put my DVR up to record so that when I get home, I can hear what it is that he has to say. If you pay close attention to the, these Hollywood TV preachers, not all of them. There's a couple of them that I listen to and have some respect for, but for the most part, if you listen to the meat of their message, it's all humanistic. I mean, think about that. Pay close attention to what it is you're hearing. Pay close attention to what it is you allow your heart and your mind to feed upon. Measure it against the Word of God and ask yourself, is this the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or is somebody just trying to tickle my ears to get into my wallet so that... Mm. <laughs> I've noticed that these messages that you're hearing me preach anymore are the ones that are extremely humanistic. And you know the ones that I'm talking about. Just apply yourself if you're going to reach goals. How many of you have ever heard that? And they'll use the book of Nehemiah to back that up. That Nehemiah had a game plan. That Nehemiah had a goal. That he wanted to rebuild the wall around the city. And, and if you just apply yourself, and if you just work really hard, then God will bless you, and you'll be able to achieve your goals. Can I tell you something? At the meat of that, it's a false message out of the mouth of a false for the Bible says it's by grace that you are saved, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. If you could work hard enough to get yourself to heaven, then you'd walk around for eternity saying, look at what I've done in order to get myself to where I'm at. And if we were able to do that, then Jesus Christ would have never had to have died on an old rugged cross and shed that blood that we sung about this morning in order for us to get to heaven. You'll never work. You'll never earn it. The work's already been done. It's all in Jesus Christ. And these humanistic messages are destroying our society. Just apply yourself and you'll reach your goals. Or how about this one? What is the Lord going to do for you today? Amen. I mean, on the surface, 
service. That sounds absolutely wonderful. How many of us wake up today and say, I wonder, I wonder how the Lord's going to bless me today? We hear that, and there's something on the inside of us that might want to say, yeah, amen, but hear me today. When the church can get back to a point in their lives where they wake up in the morning and say, Lord, how can I be a blessing to you today? How can you use me to be a blessing to someone else today? And stop saying, Lord, what can I have today? Then we'll see bigger and greater blessings. How about this message? Whatever you're going through, God will see you through it. Hmm. They're all messages about getting the promotion or living the life of prosperity. And they are all messages about self. I believe that John the Baptist said when he was speaking of Jesus Christ that I must decrease and he must increase. This is a train of thought that is all but gone from our pulpits and in our church world today. Everything is all about self. What can I do? What can I have? What can I be blessed with? What promotion can I? I heard a preacher not too long ago preaching a message that God is unpleased with you when you drive a Chevrolet because he wants you to be in a Cadillac. I thought to myself, what? Jesus said that birds in the air have a nest and the beast of the field have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to even lay his head. There's no promise of prosperity. There's no, oh, there's a promise of prosperity, but biblical prosperity and material prosperity are two totally different things. God will prosper you. God will take care of you. God will lift you up. God will bless you in your goings. I'm getting ahead of myself. Although I do believe that a ministry of encouragement toward people is very important, and I preach these kind of messages, I do not believe that it should ever be at the expense of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. That when God saved me and every preacher before me, and when God called me and every preacher before me, He saved us for the purpose of on purpose and for a purpose. And that was to touch our tongues and to raise us up amongst a group of people to open up His Word and declare the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I can preach to you about being, can I tell you something? You can prosper, you can get healed, you can receive the promotion, you can drive the Cadillac and still die lost and go to a devil's hell. Outside Jesus Christ, there is no hope. You might say, preacher, you've been preaching these kind of messages over and over and over again. It's because I believe that we're living in a time that Joel talks about. When the Spirit of the Lord shall move upon all flesh. Amen. And, and the true gospel called people are going to stand up and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe we're going to see revival. And I believe that we're going to see our lost be saved. And I believe we're going to see the churches be strengthened again. But it's not going to be on the back of a self-help book or a DVD or a video. It's going to be on the striped back of Jesus Christ who bled and died for the church and resurrected again to give us hope of eternal life. Amen. I do believe in these messages and I do preach them, but not at the expense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, we are called to holiness. If you're taking notes this morning, that's the first thing you need to write down. We are called to hope. When I was in the midst of this group of pastors and preachers, it was even more quiet in that group than it's become in this one. And I've been preaching long enough. I told them, I've been preaching long enough. And I don't need to hear an amen. We don't need to shout hallelujah. I've got the word of God in front of me and I'm following the Holy Spirit. And the, this is a truth this is a truth that needs to be embraced by the church again. We are called to holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How many of us today have a hope that one day 
We're going to see. See, we see the Lord now through faith. We pray about something and we see our prayers be answered. And we can see the hand of the Lord moving. We say, I've seen the Lord work. How many of you can say that? But how many of you can truly say, I have saw the Lord Jesus face to face? Not now, but there's coming a day when we'll be able to stand before Him and see Him face to face. We don't know what we shall be like in that day, but we know that we shall be like Him. That's what the Scripture says. I just preached that to you a week ago when I was giving you the encouragement to die with confidence. One day our faith will become reality and we'll be able to see Jesus face to face. But friend, we have to go the same way every saint has gone before us. And the Scripture tells us that Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It might not be a popular message in, in Washington. It may not be a popular message in the White House or in the Senate or even in Congress. But today, the same as every day before us, it still takes holiness in order for us to see God. Amen. Holy living. Strong. I'm just about to preach. This isn't aimed at any one person. Holy, righteous living. Standing strong in the face of the tempter's snare. Holy, righteous living. Making the right decision because it's right. Rather than falling for something that is wrong. Trusting that the Word of God is the truth. That the Holy Spirit is real. And when the devil tells you, this ain't for you, you need to stand flat footed and firm and say, I will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him only will I trust. Get me behind me, Satan. That are an offense to me. I've had people tell me, that's too old fashioned. I've had people tell me, that's too bold. I've had people tell me, that's too brazen. That nobody preaches like that anymore. That's why they're trying to pass laws to allow men to use a bathroom in a girl's bathroom. That's why we have. That's why we have abortions. That's why we have all of these social issues that we have. Is because nobody is willing to stand upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and preach with passion and preach with conviction and call sin sin and allow. When they will not endure sound doctrine, 
But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. When has the lost ever embraced the truth of God's word? When has the lost and dying world ever said, I just want the gospel and the true gospel and anything outside of the gospel I won't have? When has that ever happened? Folks, this isn't a message. This isn't a verse of scripture that Paul's given to Timothy painting a picture about what it's going to look like in a lost and a dying world because I've got news for you. The lost and the dying world has always been the lost and the dying world. Paul is prophesying to Timothy about a time that will come when the church won't stand for sound doctrine. When the church will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Today, I know I've already said this, but I'm going to say it again. We need a revival in our pulpits. From the pulpit to the pew, we need to have a revival because I'm going to tell you, somewhere between this pulpit and that pew, there's an altar and the fire of God hasn't fallen upon the altar in a long time. And the reason it hasn't fallen upon the altar in a long time is because we have not been preaching and teaching the true word of God so that the lost might be convicted and that the church might be strengthened. When we get back to preaching with the conviction and the power of the Holy Ghost. Then we'll see the church revived. When we see the church revived, we'll see our homes revived. When we see our homes revived, we'll see our communities revived. When we see that happen, then we'll see our states. When we see our states, we'll see our nation. We all want to pray for a revival in the nation, but we need to start praying for revival in the church because it starts here and then goes there. I don't understand why there's such a disdain for the old-fashioned message of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's no secret. I like the hymn book. Brother Jack, I love the old hymn book. Amen. You know you can preach a message out of the hymn book? Yeah. You absolutely can. You can start with, walk and wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Then you could go to Amazing Grace. And you, that song, Walk and Wash Away My Sin, can, can appeal to every heart that sits in the church house today because there's not one of us that's all that box of cracker jacks. Every one of us has something in our lives that we need to get rid of. So when we sit here and we wonder about it, we bite our fingernails and we think, oh man, I just must be a rotten, rotten person. Can I tell you something? You're not a rotten person. Can I tell you something? We've all said, fall short of the glory of God. Can I tell you something? Every one of us has something in our life that tempts us. Every one of us has something in our life that claims a victory over us. And so we can sing that song, What can wash this away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And feel that conviction power of the Holy Spirit of God. Then we can sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And we can feel the love of God as He wraps His arms around us and tells us, and yes, you've got sin in your life, but there's always grace and there's always mercy and it's made you every day. And I'm here to save you because I'm glad and died and resurrected so that you might obtain this salvation and child has come to me. Oh, and then we can sing, come to me. I will give you rest. Take Traditional 
about it. Everyone who knows me knows I'm going to preach the gospel. Everyone who knows me knows that we've got a hymn book in the church and it's alive and well. Everyone that knows me knows on Sunday evening I'm going to put a guitar on my shoulder, I'm going to strike a G chord, and we're going to do some old southern gospel bluegrass stuff. Everyone that knows me knows that. Not too long ago on Facebook, I posted the words to a more contemporary Christian song that just happened to bless me. And I had somebody comment on there. What? You can almost hear the sarcasm dripping out of their fingers as they type this. What? This isn't Southern Gospel. This is contemporary. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> laughing face. <laughs> and this coming from a fellow preacher. Why is there such a disdain among the church for an old fashioned gospel message of the blood, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Once again, I need to remind us there's always been a disdain in the world for it. That's nothing new. What's new is the disdain for the gospel. It's coming out of our churches. And the reason it's coming out of our churches is because there's people who are standing here that love your wallets and purses more than they love your soul and they want you to pat them on the back and tell them what good a job you did today. Hear me, I don't care about your money. I care about your soul. And I want you to be blessed in this life that God has given you. And so I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to you in its fullness. I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to you in all of its truth, in all of its power, and in all of its authority. Because maybe you're sitting here with us today saved, but you've got lost people in your home. You've got lost people in your communities. People need you to be the church. And if I don't be your pastor, you don't have a chance at being the church. We need to walk in the truth and we need to uphold it with everything that we have. What we really need to be preaching is the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to preach against sin. We need to declare that the blood of Jesus Christ is our only hope of redemption, our only hope of forgiveness, and our only hope of salvation. They wanted me to title my message before I came to this congregation of ministers. I mean, you can ask anyone that's ever worked with me in ministry. Janet and Mark can certainly tell you. I'm not one that puts titles to messages. I don't know why. I just like to open the Bible and preach. They asked me to title this message. So I titled it the reasons why I preach. I pray to God my reasons why I preach never change. We need to preach the truth. And the truth is that not everybody that lives and dies goes to heaven. Only the saved in Jesus Christ will go. The finest education in the world won't be enough to make you get into heaven. No amount of wealth or success will gain you the respect of the Father. He is far more richer than you and I will ever be. Money will perish. CDs will perish. Savings accounts will perish. Retirement plans will perish. All the money in this world is going to burn and melt with a fervent heat one of these days. Your bank account won't do you good to stand upon. Your education won't get you in. On the day of judgment, the only thing that will do you good to stand upon is the word of God. Tell you the truth that religion 
Religion will give you just enough to remain lost and headed for a devil's head. You know, Jesus painted a picture of the churches when John was being, when, when things were being revealed to John and, and there were some letters that went up to the churches. One of the letters to the church of Laodicea. The Lord told John, I would that you were hot or cold. But since you're neither hot nor cold, but are lukewarm, Jesus said, I'll spew thee from my mouth. And I've often wondered about that. I can understand why the Lord would want us to be hot, to be on fire for the Lord. You know, I can understand that. But why be cold? And then it came to me one day. If you're on fire for the Lord, then He's using you. Okay? You wake up every morning, before you hit your floor, every devil in hell is saying, oh my God, she's awake again. Or he's, he's awake again. And the fight is on. If you're on fire for God, your co-workers know it. If you're on fire for God, even the dog, I remember when I got saved, even the dogs knew something changed in me. <laughs> when you're on fire for God, it's just, you're on fire for God. If you're cold and indifferent and want nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that heart can be worked with. That heart can be told the truth. Yes. That heart can, can, the gospel of Jesus Christ can be revealed to that heart. And through the power of conviction and the Holy Spirit, they can be drawn to an altar of repentance and they too can be saved. But that lukewarm person, I'm going to tell you who the lukewarm is. The lukewarm is the person who has had religion for 20 years and knows all of the thousand and thou shalt not. They've got all of the rules, they've got all of the regulations. They've learned to get the Baptist haircut. Amen. They've learned. They've learned to put on the right suit. They've learned to carry the right Bible. Oh, I don't carry that Bible. I carry this Bible. I'm a good Baptist. You'll see them praying over their food at Burger King. You'll see them doing everything that needs to be done as per their rules and their regulations. But their hearts are so far from God because they have not received Jesus Christ. They've received their religion, but they haven't received Jesus. And I've preached this before, and I'll preach it again. I wish everyone would lose their religion and just get Jesus. Because religion won't save you either. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to preach that at the end of this life, there is a judgment to face where sin will be judged. I'm going to say this again. Sin and sinful behaviors will be judged. And they'll be judged by a holy, righteous God. We need to make sure that everyone knows that this judgment is coming. We need to make sure that they know the reason for judgment is so that sin can be judged. And we need to make sure that everyone knows that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because if you preach that message about sin and you don't let it be known that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you're going to have someone sitting in your congregation underneath so much conviction that they just might run out and never but when you raise your hand in the air and look them in the eye and say, I'm your pastor and I've been tempted and I've committed sin and I've had to fall on my face before a holy righteous God and say, can you forgive me? Only to see the Son stand at the right hand of the Father and say, Father, this one's mine. And no matter what you've done, the love of God and the blood of Jesus Christ can save you again. And strength and draw. We need to preach that. We need to preach it. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 through 20. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. I want to first point out to you that this one that John saw sitting on this cloud, the Bible says, was likened unto the Son of Man. 
And in the book of Acts, and in the first chapter, and in verses 9 and 10, we read this. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. We're talking about Jesus. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, Was G 
Jesus Christ taking his church home. Because if you noticed, the very first reaping was the one likened to the Son of Man who had the sharp sickle in his hand, and he reaped, he reaped from the earth. And then another angel came and was given the command to reap the rest of the earth. So what you have just witnessed, and I don't know if you paid attention to it, that's why I'm drawing it out. What you have just witnessed is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church of God, which is in Jesus Christ. Jesus took the church out, and then came a reaping, and then came a tribulation such as never was or never will be again. And then cometh a judgment. Folks, these verses of Scripture are absolutely about a coming judgment. What's that, Pastor? We never even knew there was such a thing. Can I tell you the truth? There is coming a day when everyone shall stand before the Lord and take account of their life in every idle word. He said, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden about the city and the blood came out of the winepress even into the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. I can remember the old preachers preaching about a judgment to come and warning people if you get left behind and are here when the world is judged for its sin, you need to understand something that the blood will flow right a bit deep to a horse. And I used to think, where are they getting that from? This is where they're getting it from. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be here to be judged along with this world for its sinfulness. You want to be one in that number that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Who has your name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus Christ has to, has to, has to be your number one priority. Because outside of Him, there is no hope. The Scriptures, the Scriptures teach us in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Then shall they say unto Him, that, that is on the right, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared from the foundation of the world. And Matthew 3 verse 12 says, Whose fan is in His hand, and He will thoroughly purge His floor, and gather His wheat into the garner, but He will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Today heaven is real, but today hell is real, and judgment is coming. Our only hope is to continue to declare the truth of the Word of God. Preach the blood of Jesus Christ. Preach the death, the burial, the resurrection. And watch your ch I'm not preaching to the preachers today. If we and watch our church get revived, get on fire for God. When you get revived and you get on fire for God, then I get revived and I get on fire for God. And then more passion from the pulpit flows. And more conviction from the pulpit flows. And the more passion that goes from here to there, the more passion you're going to have. And the more conviction that comes from here to there, the more conviction you're going to have. And when we're all walking in the power and we're all walking in the conviction, then get ready. Because the windows of heaven
scripture. Don't look anything like the ones you find in a daily devotional book or the ones being posted all over social media. And the reason you won't find these messages is because people no longer want to answer to the truth anymore. And the devil doesn't want you to come to the truth of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I entitled this message, The Reasons Why I Preach. The reason why I preach is easier explained. Is the reason why I don't preach. I don't preach in order to create religious people. I preach in order to create saved people. Amen. I don't preach in an attempt to get more people to attend my church. I'm preaching to let them know that Jesus loves them. You and all of your sinful ways, He loves you just as you are. But praise His holy name, He also loves you enough to forgive you and to change you from the creature you are into the person He created you to be. There really is a good life for everyone in Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that good life. Amen. If He's blessed you and given you a good life, give me my hand back to the church this morning. Amen. I'm preaching to let you know that Jesus Christ defeated the power of sin. He defeated the power of death. He defeated the power of hell. And He defeated the power of the grave. And when you get your hands on this truth, that empty message about promotions and goals, well on the candle to the real truth. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching to let you know that outside of Jesus Christ, even if you are the senior pastor in a 50-year ministry, you have no hope outside of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching to let you know that even though you may be the assistant pastor of a church that has 1,500 people, that without Jesus Christ, you'll die lost and split the gates of hell wide open. I'm also preaching to let you know that if you're in Jesus, and Jesus is in you, no matter what happens, no matter where you're at, no matter what's going on, you're safe. Yes. Amen. Don't anticipate you. You're safe. You're okay. Folks, I feel like I've preached my message. I'm going to leave you with this. Just trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord. Don't be lured by the worldly wisdom that wants to tell a church what a church needs to have in order to reach its lost. Hold to the truth in your life. And let the Holy Spirit tell the church what the church needs to have in order to reach the lost. I know this was a, I'm going to tell you, this is a hard message to preach. It may have even been a harder message to listen to. But the scripture tells us we shall be true. And the truth shall make the truth. Let's rise to our feet. It's a song. I want you to know that there's passion coming from this point. I try so very hard to live, to preach, and to teach from the convictions that the Lord has laid upon my heart. And I'm more passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think, than I am about anything else. And I'm passionate about a few things. I want you to know today that there was conviction, that there was passion that came out of this moment. And hopefully, it's my prayer today, in that first meeting, to see 50 pastors and assistant pastors weeping in an altar.
And I want you to be gathered around this altar to experience it when it does. You want to be on fire for God? Allow that conviction and allow that passion to guide your heart to an altar where the fire can fall. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I'm too dignified for that. I don't want people seeing me at the altar and wondering what's going on in his life, what's going on in her life. Stop worrying about what people are thinking. There's been a true message sent from heaven to you today, and you can be revived. You can be on fire. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can be strengthened. If you'll just move in that conviction and that passion up here to this altar where the fire of God can fall upon you. Preacher, you're making me uncomfortable. Can't I just pray in my pew? Yeah, you can, but I'm charging you today to step out on faith. Walk a few steps. They're preaching today seven steps to a brand new you. I'm going to tell you the only seven steps you need to take for a brand new you are the seven steps it'll take you to get from that pew to an altar. Would you open your heart on behalf of your home? Would you open your heart on behalf of your loved ones? Would you open your heart on behalf of your church? Would you come? Would you come? I'm not going to carry this much longer. I'm going to pray here in just a moment. Thank God for one. Thank God for one. I often said it's just one excuse. I've done my job. Thank God for one. Our God and our Father. The Lord is that name. Our God and our Lady. Our sisters and our Lady. I thank you. I thank you for the mercy. I thank you for the mercy in this life. You know the things that this couple has gone through. 
You know the things that they've experienced in their lives apart and in their lives together. You know the hurts and you know the hardships. But Father, I want to praise you because they've remained faithful. I want to praise you because they've remained truthful. And I just pray today, Lord, as they kneel down upon this altar as well, that you'll open up the windows of heaven and send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon them. Give them, Lord, an unction from the Holy One to continue to serve. Give them, Lord, an unction from the Holy One and strengthen them and lift them and bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for a fire to fall in their home. I pray for a fire to fall in their families. I pray for a fire to fall in their children. Draw their children, Lord, back to an altar of repentance. I pray for their grandchildren. I pray for healing over Katie. I pray, Lord, for, I just pray for a moving of your spirit over their grandchildren. I just bless them, Lord, in any way that you see fit. But, Father, allow your gospel to remain alive and run inside their hearts. And I'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Our God and our Father, as I lay my hands upon this dear brother, Lord, I know the things that you've been doing in his life and how you've been working in him and through him and healing him and blessing him and holding through so many circumstances with his health. Today, Lord, I know that there's a plan and a purpose in this man's life. Father God, I've never considered myself to be one much of a prophet, although I do believe that you're beginning to reveal prophetic things to me. This is an area in my life, God, that I'm not comfortable with, but I can't preach to these people to move in faith if I'm not willing to do the same. I feel today, Lord, that you've got a gift in this man. A gift of prayer. A gift of the laying of hands. I know tonight, Lord, today, Lord, that you've healed him in so many different ways. Just feel that you could use him as a powerful tool in your hand to lay hands upon people and to pray for them. Lord, that you might work in their lives and draw and convict and heal. So, Father, whatever it is he's praying for and about, I want to stand in the gap with him and pray that you hear his prayers and answer according to your will and to his purpose. But, Father, you've got a call on his life. I can I know. So I pray that you would allow that call to come alive and that you would use this prayer. Bless his home. Bless his relationship with his wife. Such a wonderful, beautiful person. I thank you, Lord, for his sister Janet as well. Father, just bless their home. Bless their family. Draw their children. Save their grandchildren. Sanctify them to yourself, Lord, that they might not sin against you. We'll give you the praise. And let the fire fall upon him. Let the fire fall in their home. This rest in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, as I close my eyes and bow my head again before the congregation, I praise you, Lord, for the truth. I praise you, Lord, for the many instances that you've called upon me to declare this message. Lord, I don't want to get myself out of the way. I don't want my name attached to it. I don't want my hands apply to it. This is your work. This is your message. You said Bless these people, Lord. Each and every one. Search their hearts. Hear their prayers. Revive them. Lift them. Strengthen them. Edify them. Let them know that they're in Christ. Christ is in them. That this is real. They have power. Revive the gospel. Praise Father God. I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too, so I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, please keep them all safe from harm's way. Bring us back at our next point in time where once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we give to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.